Hello everyone, it's Dr. Locklear here, and we are continuing our focus on uh, the concept of perfusion. We're going to be talking about in this recording, Exemplar 16G, Hypertension. This is a very detailed chapter. Uh, this YouTube link I will show in class, but you can watch it too if you would like to. There's a lot of information in here. We are going to see that there are a lot of factors that affect your blood pressure. There's primary hypertension, secondary hypertension, and hypertensive crisis. And there are lots of medications. I highly recommend that you go back and look in your um, ATI book as well and look at these anti-hypertensive drugs in your ATI pharmacology book because we have several categories and all of these drugs that are listed in this uh, chart are given out in practice. So what are our outcomes? What is the patho of hyper hypertension? And we have hypertension and hypotension. And so what causes it? Uh, how does it occur? What are the risk factors? How can we prevent it? So when we talk about prevention, think about education. What do you see when you assess a patient? What clinical manifestations, what assessment findings will you get? What data do you collect and what do you analyze? Remember to analyze it, assess and report, assess and report. Diagnostic test, what are the therapies that um, the collaborative uh, team uses to uh, develop a plan of care specific for each patient? Uh, hypertension across the lifespan, so how does it affect people at different ages? And we're seeing a lot more hypertension in younger uh, children because of uh, childhood obesity. And then the nursing process, again, assess and, and report. So let's get started. In November of 2017, the American College of Cardiology in conjunction with the American Heart Association, presented new guidelines for hypertension. Blood pressure that is higher than normal. That's the definition. The definition of normal blood pressure has been lowered to less than 120 over 80 of millimeters of mercury. Elevated BP begins when systolic blood pressure rises above 120, while diastolic is still below 80. And look at the table on page 1299, and you can see uh, the definitions 120 to 129 in diastolic, less than 80, that's elevated. Then you have stage one hypertension, stage two. And as you can see in hypertensive crisis, the systolic is 180 and the diastolic is 120. So we're getting on up there into a, a situation for heart attack and a stroke. While asymptomatic in most cases, hypertension is a major risk factor for cardiac comorbidity, stroke, and renal disease. It is a worldwide public health issue. With the 2017 guidelines, well over 80 million American adults have high blood pressure. So it is a, it is a problem uh, in the United States. And as you can see, um, some of the major risk factors are coronary heart disease, heart failure, stroke, and renal failure. And these are some of the things that um, can cause it and uh, make it worse. So what is the pathophysiology? Blood pressure refers to the force exerted in the arterial circulatory system as blood is pumped from the heart. A common important measurement of blood pressure is the mean arterial pressure or the MAP. And we are gonna learn how to calculate MAP. The MAP is the average pressure and can be estimated by adding one third of the systolic pressure plus two thirds of the diastolic pressure. And I, I have a formula on here for you to look at. Blood pressure is impacted by blood flow, volume of blood in the vessel, as the volume causes distension of the multilayered thick arterial walls. As the blood moves through the capillary beds, pressure is reduced. The venous system is a low pressure vascular system delivering blood back to the heart. Arterial blood pressure results from systolic ejection of blood from the left heart in combination with the vascular resistance of the arterial walls and the blood is pumped from the left ventricle 
to the body and it's oxygenated, has received blood from uh, the lungs where it picked up oxygen, got rid of CO2. Arterial blood pressure results from systolic ejection of blood from the left heart in combination with the vascular resistance of the arterial walls. The pressure wave created by systole or systole can be sensed through touch as a pulse. It can also be heard as a cortical sound during BP measurement or carotcal. I've always been told it was cortical. Uh, cardiac output is the result of the volume of blood in combination with ventricular filling and pumping ability. Factors contributing to systemic vascular resistance include vessel length, blood thickness or viscosity, and vascular mechanisms such as diameter, length, and compliance. Of these, diameter and compliance directly impact peripheral vascular resistance, or PVR. The resistance against blood flow, which consists of blood viscosity, thicker blood encounters greater resistance in the blood vessel, length of the vessel, longer blood vessels experience greater resistance, Diameter of the vessel, the inverse relationship results in more resistant and smaller vessels, which that makes sense. If you think about it, it, it makes sense. So here again, um, here's a little formula to measure systemic vascular resistance. And I'm not going to expect you to know that, but you are going to have to know how to calculate MAP. Okay. And again, when we're talking about MAP, we're talking about the measurement of blood pressure is the arter mean arterial pressure. And what that really means is how is the patient perfusing? Is the blood that they may be getting blood, but they may not be the blood may not be perfusing the oxygen that it needs. Factors influencing arterial blood pressure. From the major arteries, the blood flows into the arterioles. These vessels have the greatest impact on your systemic vascular resistance due to responses to multiple stimuli. And here's some, and there's multiple. There's there's like oh a bunch of bullets. So we're gonna we're gonna walk through each one of these. Sympathetic nervous system stimulation is triggered when a sensing of a drop in MAP by the aortic arch and carotid sinus baroreceptors or pressure receptors. The information is sent to the CV control center in the medulla oblongata, resulting in increased heart rate. Cardiac output and arterial, const and arterial, arterial constriction. Let me, let me say that again. I didn't say it right. The information is sent to the CV control center in the medulla oblongata, resulting in increased heart rate, cardiac output, and arterial constriction. So you got three things going on here. This results in a rise in blood pressure. An elevation in MAP would result in BP changes in the opposite direction, slowed heart rate, lower cardiac output, and arterial dilation. Circulating epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal gland cortex, the fight or flight response, have the same effect as the central nervous system stimulation. Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system alterations are activated by renal perfusion changes. A renal perfusion reduction triggers renin release, converting angiotensin to angiotensin 1, then angiotensin 2, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin II also triggers sodium and water retention and stimulates the adrenal gland medulla to release aldosterone. Atrial natriuretic peptide, which is your AMP, and brain natri natriuretic peptide, which is your BMP, are proteins released from cells of the cardiac atria and ventricles when these structures are stretched with excess blood volume. Their release triggers vasodilation and excretion of sodium and water in the urine. So we know the kidneys have a big effect on our blood pressure. So if our kidneys are not functioning properly, our blood pressure is going to be affected and usually it goes up. Adrenomedullum, 
is a potent vasodilator released by the endothelial and smooth muscle layers of uh, blood vessels. Vasopressin, or antidiuretic hormone, causes vasoconstriction and water retention. It is produced by the hypothalamus and secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. Local factors can include inflammatory mediators and various metabolites that promote vasodilation. So vasopressin and your antidiuretic hormone cause vasoconstriction, which is going to make your blood pressure go up. Other physiological factors that can affect blood vessels compliance include arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, and atherosclerosis, plaque accumulation. Uh, this summarizes the interrelationship of major factors regulating BP. The cardiovascular system adapts to increase blood volume by increasing cardiac output. Autoregulatory mechanisms in the systemic arteries react to the increased volume causing vasoconstriction. The increased systemic vascular resistance causes hypertension. So let's look at some other factors. Factors that impact arterial circulation are Primary mechanisms include sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Stimulation of the SNS causes vasoconstriction of the arterial rolls. Stimulation of the parasympathetic system causes vasodilation of the arterial rolls. Other mechanisms include the baroreceptors and chemoreceptors in the aortic arch, carotid sinus, and other large vessels. These are triggered by decreased pressure and chemical changes leading to reflex sympathetic stimulation with vasoconstriction, increased heart rate, and increased BP as the end result. The renal system has an important role in BP maintenance through the excretion or conservation of sodium and water. Low blood pressure leads to stimulation of the RAS, which is your renin, angiotensin, uh, antidiuretic hormone uh, system, the RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, that's a mouthful. Additionally, aldosterone is released, resulting in sodium and water retention, while antidiuretic hormone is secreted from the posterior pituitary gland, leading to reabsorption of water. Body temperature affects peripheral vascular resistance with cold triggering vasoconstriction and warmth causing vasodilation. Other processes and hormones can also impact BP, such as epinephrine and endothelin, a protein in the endothelium, that cause vasoconstriction, while prostaglandins, alcohol, and histamine lead to vascular dilation. Lifestyle factors focus on diet, including salt, saturated fats, and cholesterol, and so limiting these. Risk factors, both modifiable, non-modifiable, race, sex, and age can't be changed, and modifiable, weight, time of day, body posi position, exercise, emotional state can influence both arterial and venous pressures. So let's look at the different types of blood pressure. We have primary, so primary, secondary, and hypertensive crisis. Primary hypertension, previously called essential hypertension, is persistently elevated systemic BP that has no known cause. Approximately 108 million individuals in the United States have hypertension, and more are of 90% are primary. What causes it? Here's the interactions. Excessive SNS stimulation is caused by the overloading of alpha and beta adrenergic receptors and results in vasoconstriction and increased cardiac output. Malfunction of the RAS impacts responsiveness to sodium and fluid volume. The RAS affects vasomotor motor tone as well as sodium and water excretion. Arteriolar remodeling can be caused by chronic elevation of angiotensin II leading to a permanent elevation of systemic vascular resistance or SVR. Low plasma renin levels are more often seen in people of sub-Saharan African ancestry than those of European, North American, or Southwest, and then it lists some more uh, ethnic backgrounds. Vasomotor tone is also impacted by chemical mediators such as your AMP, endothelium. One is a potent vasoconstrictor. Endocrine dysfunction, insulin resistance, 
and hyperinsulinemia interacts with endothelial function resulting in hypertension. Elevated insulin can also impact renal function resulting in sodium retention, elevated SNS activity, and vascular smooth muscle hypertrophy. So you have a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, several of your systems, you know, your endocrine system, your, your, your renal system, all can affect it. These interactions result in increased peripheral resistance and blood volume leading to elevated cardiac output. Regulating mechanisms react to these increases, triggering vasoconstriction and resulting in measurable BP elevation. There is no single cause with supporting evidence related to pathophysiologic mechanisms leading to hypertension. So we've got some things going on here. Um, your sympathetic nervous system, your kidney system, the RAS system, some of these chemical mediators, your A and P. So uh, a lot of things can affect it. What is secondary hypertension? <clears throat> this refers to elevated BP with a known cause. It accounts for only five to 10%. The underlying causes are kidney disease, reduced renal blood flow caused by renal artery stenosis or renal malfunction such as glomerulonephritis or renal failure stimulate the RAS resulting in vasoconstriction with sodium and water retention. This leads to hypertension. Coartation of the aorta. Aortic narrowing immediately distal to the subclavian arteries leads to reduced renal and peripheral blood flow. This triggers the RAS. A significant symptom is different pressures in the upper versus lower extremities. Other symptoms seen in the lower extremities include weak pulses and delayed capillary refill. Endocrine disorders, disorders of the adrenal glands such as Cushing syndrome and primary aldosteronism can lead to hypertension. A benign tumor of the adrenal gland medulla called pheochromocytoma can also lead to persistent hypertension. Hyperparathyroidism or pituitary disorders can also trigger it as well. Neurologic disorders. When increased intracranial pressure is present, the body attempts to maintain cerebral blood flow by elevating the peripheral BP. Other neurologic disorders that impact BP include high spinal cord injury, which interferes with autonomic nervous system regulation. Drug use. Multiple categories of drugs can trigger hypertension. Hormonal preparations such as estrogen and oral contraceptives may promote sodium and water retention. Stimulants such as cocaine or methamphetamines increase cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Drugs that can contribute to secondary hypertension include decongestants, estrogen or other hormones, corticosteroids, cyclosporin, antidepressants, and NSAIDs when used in long term. Pregnancy. Up to 10% of pregnant women experience hypertension. It may be pre-morbid condition prior to the pregnancy or a comorbidity with the pregnancy. Mechanisms remain unclear, but gestational hypertension is a significant cause of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. And, and some of it has to do with the increase in fluid volume with the pregnancy. Hypothyroidism. 20 to 40% of patients with hypothyroidism have hypertension. Thyroid hormone is a smooth muscle relaxant, therefore hypothyroidism may lead to increased constriction and vascular resistance as well as increases in serum norepinephrine and aldosterone and decreases in endothelium derived relaxation factor production. Hypothyroidism is also associated with coronary artery disease and we know coronary artery disease uh, when those vessels are affected the blood pressure can rise. Obstructive sleep apnea. Sleep apnea has an adverse effect on the autonomic nervous system, as shown by increased plasma levels of catecholamines. The incidence and degree of hypertension is directly proportional to the frequency and severity of apnea episodes. Sleep apnea also interrupts the normal pattern of blood pressure reduction during sleep. The clinical course of secondary hypertension depends on the underlying cause. Pheochromocytoma can trigger a hypertensive crisis that can last for minutes to hours, accompanied by anxiety, palpitations, diaphoresis, pallor, and nausea and vomiting. Primary aldosteronism results in multiple symptoms beyond hypertension, including weakness, parathesias, 
polyuria, and nocturia. Renal disease causes a whole constellation of symptoms in addition to hypertension. So that's secondary hypertension. Now hypertensive crisis. And so uh, this is a, a, an emergency. Some patients with hypertension may develop rapid, significant elevations in systolic and or diastolic pressures. The reasons for this are not clearly understood. And a hypertensive crisis, also called malignant hypertension or hypertensive emergency, systolic pressure is greater than 180 millimeters of mercury and or diastolic pressure is greater than 120. And on the screen here, the little uh, picture I found said 110, but our book says 120. The immediate treatment goal is to prevent cardiac, renal, and or vascular damage. In the presence of severely elevated BP, intense cerebral ar artery spasms can occur as a protective measure, but subsequently cerebral edema develops. Prolonged hypertensive crisis leads to arterial wall and renal damage and can lead to acute renal failure and to stroke. And it didn't list stroke, but it can. What are the causes? Hypertension affects middle age and older adults, mostly. An age-related increase in the systolic blood pressure is the primary factor leading to high incidence of hypertension in the older adult. Unlike the diastolic pressure, which tends to, to rise until approximately age 50 and then decline, the systolic blood pressure continues to rise with age. The prevalence of hypertension is significantly higher in black patients than in white and Hispanic patients. And it gives you a list here um, American uh, Indians and Alaska Natives are also uh, affected, but everybody can be affected by high blood pressure. What are the risk factors? You have a whole list of risk, risk factors here. Both the environmental and genetic roles in hypertension, um, uh, both environmental and genetics have a role in hypertension. Hypertensive emergencies are seen more commonly in males, black individuals, smokers, older adults, pregnant women with preeclampsia, and in those with renal or uh, collagen diseases. And so hypertension has many, many risk factors. Family history, your age, your race, mineral intake, and it lists here, it talks about excessive sodium intake, uh, talking about sodium and other minerals, potassium, calcium, and magnesium uh, caused by unknown mechanisms. Obesity, being overweight, insulin resistance, and we had read about that earlier. Alcohol, stress. stress you ever heard stress will kill you? Well, that is true. Stress um, puts um, a lot of pressure on the body. So BP elevation is known to occur with physical or emotional stress. Stress activates angiotensin II, part of the RAS, and we know angiotensin II is a, a very potent vasoconstrictor. Physical inactivity. Regular exercise is proven to reduce it. Vitamin D deficiency. There's association between decreased vitamin D and hypertension. And, but it says that, that vitamin D does not appear to reverse it. And then depression. Prevention. How do we prevent it? Prevention of hypertension involves healthy lifestyle choices and habits. Look at box 16.2. And this is on page... Let me find it. 16.2. I'm not sure where it's at. I don't see it in here. Or did I look at it wrong? It says 16.2. Um, healthy lifestyle choices. I thought I saw that a while ago. Maybe I skipped a page. I don't know. But anyway, making healthy lifestyle choices. We know that's going to affect our health all the way around. Patients with prehypertension should take steps to avoid progressing to high blood pressure and to follow their treatment regimens. 16.2 uh, may actually be in the actual concept of uh, perfusion. And so let's, um, let's go back and look if I can find that box and... Uh, 16.2. Yes, it's on page 1183. Heart Healthy Lifestyle Modifications, page 1183. That's, it's in the actual concept of perfusion. 
Strategies include maintaining a healthy weight and a healthy diet with reduced salt intake, regular physical exercise, using stress management techniques, following your medications, and avoid, avoiding too fasted or too hot. Patients diagnosed with high blood pressure should obtain regular medical care and follow their prescribed treatment plan. Healthy lifestyle habits can prevent high blood pressure from occurring, can reverse prehypertension and help control existing hypertension, or can prevent the complications and long-term problems associated with it. So what do we see? What are the clinical manifestations? Primary hypertension is asymptomatic. An elevated BP is the cardinal sign. When vague symptoms appear, headache at the back of the head and neck, they, they can be an indication of target organ damage to the heart, brain, eyes, and kidneys. Late symptoms can include nocturia, confusion, nausea, and vomiting. Changes in vision may be related to retinal damage that includes narrowing arterioles, hemorrhaging, exudates, or papilledema, swelling of the optic nerve. Sustained hypertension has severe, potentially life-threatening consequences and affects the cardiovascular, neurologic, and renal systems. With sustained hypertension, atherosclerosis rate accelerates, increasing the risk for coronary artery disease and stroke. Left ventricular workload increases, leading to ventricular hypertrophy. This in turn triggers further development of coronary artery disease, dysrhythmias, and heart failure. Until the age of 50, diastolic blood pressure is a significant cardiovascular risk factor. After age 50, systolic pressure becomes the more important factor. Cerebral vessel hypertension can produce microaneurysm development, increasing the risk for cerebral hemorrhage. Hypertensive encephalopathy, a syndrome characterized by extremely high blood pressure, alter level of consciousness, increased intracranial pressure, optic nerve edema, and seizures may develop. Hypertension also can lead to renal uh, morbidity such as nephrosclerosis and renal insufficiency. Early signs include proteinuria and microscopic hematuria. Black populations experience hypertensive kidney disease more frequently than white populations. Hypertension is the number one cause of end-stage renal disease. Patients presenting with a hypertensive emergency may manifest symptoms reflecting neurologic, visual, motor, or sensory deficits such as a headache, confusion, blurred vision, restlessness, and weakness and or paresthesias. Manifestations of hypertensive emergencies are listed in the clinical manifestations and therapies chart. So you have a chart on page 1303, and um, it talks about hypertensive crisis and stroke. And so when you have hypertensive crisis, your clinical manifestations, systolic 180, diastolic greater than 120, headache, confusion, motor sensory deficits. Stroke is a sudden onset of loss of sensation and or movement, maybe hemiplegia, hemiparesis, uh, flaccidity of the muscle, uh, spasticity of the muscle, or sensory loss of vision, hearing, taste, touch, and proprioception or smell. So you may have some paralysis of the left arm, left leg, your eye, your tongue. You may not be able to talk. Um, hypertensive crisis, what do we do? Administer medications, um, vasodilators, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or beta adrenergic blockers. BP should be lowered gradually to prevent shock. Monitor patients' BP continuously. Reduce anxiety, which can cause it to rise. For the stroke, you want to monitor their level of consciousness. Administer anticoagulants, thrombolytics, corticosteroids for the inflammation, and antihypertensives for the blood pressure. They may have a carotid endorectomy and other procedures and reduce the intracranial pressure to prevent further damage. And uh, that was just a, um, a, a segue into um, a little bit of um, about stroke. And then, uh, did I miss? I don't think I did. I think I've covered all of this, yes. I want to make sure before I go to the next slide, okay? Okay, 
And then here's your um, clinical manifestations for hypertensive uh, crisis. And again, this is in your chart here, right? And then collaboration, what do we do? Although primary hypertension cannot be cured, it can be controlled. Blood pressure reduction is the focus of management with a goal of a systolic pressure of less than 130 and diastolic less than 80. Prevention of cardiovascular and renal morbidity and mortality is the overarching goal. With average BP at less than 130 over 90, the risk of cardiovascular complications, CAD, heart failure, and stroke decrease. In a patient with diabetes or renal disease, the treatment goal is a BP of less than 129 over 79. Lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, and stress management are the first recommendations in uh, hypertension management. Safety alert, exercises that involve breath holding, such as isosymmetric exercises, weight training, may not be appropriate for individuals with hypertension because it can raise the systolic blood pressure. Diagnostic testing. When a patient's been diagnosed as having hypertension, evaluation of its identifiable causes, cardiovascular risk factors, and the presence or absence of target organ damage is indicated. Prior to treatment initiation, diagnostic tests are performed. These include ECG, urinalysis, blood glucose, hematocrit, serum creatinine, vitamin D, calcium and cholesterol, lipoproteins, HDLs, LDLs, and triglycerides. Other tests may include urinary albumin excretion measurement of the glomerular filtration rate, creatinine clearance, and tests for emerging cardiovascular factors such as C-reactive protein and homocysteine levels. And you'll see your diagnostic test uh, listed on page 1304, renal function test, potassium levels, your blood chemistry panels looking at electrolytes and lipids and glucose, and then CTs, MRIs, and uh, ultrasounds and renal uh, tests as well. And he, these are listed here for you. Okay. Pharmacological. Okay, here we go. Uh, it, your book does a, a good breakdown. This should be a repeat for you because you have had pharmacology. So I'm going to, instead of read through this, I want you to read through this. This should be a review for you. Um, you have your alpha adrenergic blockers, and these block alpha receptors in vascular smooth muscle. And of course, with any blood pressure, you may want, you want to uh, blood pressure medicine, monitor their blood pressure, monitor their pulse rate because they may have dizziness, they may be lightheaded, um, they may have what it calls here first dose syncope. You have alpha-2 adrenergic um, agonist, and these are for um, the central nervous system to suppress the sympathetic outflow to the heart and the blood vessels. Again, look what it says, administer oral doses at bedtime to minify the effects of sedation. Take with meals. Don't skip. Your uh, beta blockers. Uh, one thing that was interesting, not that this is just not this is a test question, but one thing that was interesting, monitor digoxin level when used concurrently can increase dig level. People can get dig toxic very quickly. Your um, ACE inhibitors. Uh, all of these I give many times out in practice. Uh, monitor patient for first time syncope, persistent cough with the ACE inhibitors. And you'll see that a lot with um, uh, this uh, particular classification of uh, drugs here. Um, and I don't see the one I'm looking for. Let's see. Uh, A lot of times with your uh, metoprolol, um, you'll see a lot of coffee with the metoprolol as well. I don't see metoprolol listed here. Where is metoprolol? Oh, here it is. That's your beta adrenergic blockers. You'll see some coughing, uh, and like it says, bronchospasm with that. Please read through this chart for, for time purposes. Um, this, this can be a very lengthy, and uh, I know y'all don't want to have to sit and listen to this. Uh, but remember, with all, all blood pressure medicines, 
and uh, it affects your blood pressure. That's what we're trying to do, get your blood pressure down. So you may, um, your heart rate will decrease as well. You need to monitor those before you even give these and look at the, the um, uh, compatibility with other drugs. Look right here, it says for the calcium channel blockers, do not administer verapamil or dilatoxam to patients with severe hypotension or sinus or AV blocks. So you have some medicines that you, you have to get an EKG on before you can actually give the medication. And this chart here also talks about your potassium sparing diuretics, your loop diuretics, and your thiazide diuretics. Please review this chart. Yes, there are medicines on the test from this chart, okay? And read the material here, okay? It's got three sections here. It gives you your drug categories, and um, it talks about um, all of these categories in the reading here, okay? So please make sure you go over that. Um, here's a little chart to help you remember. And um, these are uh, just some little mnemonics that you can look at. Um, I thought this was really uh, neat um, and just kind of help you remember some of the drug names. If not, you don't have to use it, but you can remember. This is for beta blockers. And then again, your drug classifications here, um, vasodilators, vasodilate. That's why I put this picture on here. You see the constriction there, and then now the vessel's dilated. You need to bring it down slowly because um, you don't. if you bring it down too fast, you're going to throw the person in shock. Their blood pressure is going to drop too fast. Okay, Drug regimens. Hypertension treatment is started with a single antihypertensive drug at a low dose. A diuretic, commonly a thiazide, ACE, ARB, or CCB. Now your ACE is your ACE inhibitor. ARB means your um, angiotensin II receptor blocker meds. Okay, that's the angiotensin II. And CCB are your calcium channel blockers may be the first line drug. A diuretic is the preferred treatment for systolic hypertension in older adults because we want to get the fluid out. The dose is slowly increased until optimal BP control is achieved. If the drug does not effectively lower the blood pressure, has troubling side effects, a different drug from another category or antihypertensive medication is substituted. If on the other hand, the drug is tolerated well, but does not lower the BP to the desired level, then you may have a second drug, and I've seen patients on four blood pressure medicines. In stage two hypertension, treatment is more aggressive with the goal to minimize MI, heart failure, or stroke. Systolic blood pressure greater than 160 or diastolic greater than 100 requires immediate treatment with possible hospitalization. Dose reduction may be considered following one year of effective hypertension control. This step-down therapy is most effective in patients who have made lifestyle modifications. Vigilant blood pressure monitoring is necessary during and after step-down therapy, and of course, that makes sense. Your next slide talks about lifestyle modifications, and you've got the DASH diet on page 13010. And so <clears throat> when you're looking at the DASH diet, you're looking at six to eight servings of grains a day, four to five of vegetables, fruits, fat-free or low-fat uh, milks, nuts, seeds, and legumes, which are beans, uh, fats and fish oils, uh, two to three servings uh, per day, and sweets and added sugars, five or few servings per week should be low, okay? And so with the DASH, this is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Make sure you review that. I do like to use questions about diet sometimes because we have to educate our patients sometimes about that. Um, lifestyle considerations. Again, hypertensive crisis in children. You have a table that gives you the normal blood pressure from birth to age 15. Okay, And just read over that, all right? Hypertension in the older adult. That's what we've been talking about um, this whole uh, recorded um, uh, lecture. Overview of your calcium channel blockers. This is just a little chart to help you, okay? This was just to help you, okay? Don't freak out, all right? Um, it's just, just something for you to look at, okay? And then your nursing process. Hypertension 
Health promotion focuses on modifiable risk factors. Nurses should review smoking history in all patients, including children and adolescents, because we know teenagers smoke, and promote cessation. Risk of obesity, excess alcohol intake, and sedentary lifestyle should be reviewed with patients. And this is, again, the younger generation. They fall in that category. Promoting a healthy diet that's high in fruits and vegetables should be encouraged. Remember the DASH diet. Reinforce alcohol intake to, in moderation with no more than 1.5 ounces of hard liquor, 5 to 10 ounces of wine, or 10 to 20 ounces of beer per day. Promote gradual, well, and, and you have to, you know, uh, alcohol doesn't just affect the cardiovascular system, but it affects your liver as well. So um, you really, you know, be, need to be very mindful of, of how much alcohol intake occurs. Um, aerobic exercise at least five days per week um, and do it gradually. Remind the patient that exercise can be stress reducing, but it doesn't need to be rigorous exercise. So what do we see with our assessment and observation and physical exam? Individuals with hypertension often have no observable signs or symptoms. Therefore, the assessment of hypertension should focus on the patient interview and physical exam. Assess patient for complaints of morning headache or cervical pain cardiovascular or central nervous system manifestations, history of hypertension, renal disease or diabetes, family history of high blood pressure, heart failure or kidney disease, and current medications. What are you looking for on the physical exam? Uh, you're looking at vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate, and are, are, are the pulses bounding? Uh, bounding means a, a hard pulse when you're feeling that radial pulse, or it sounds like it's bounding when you're listening. Um, you may need to look at the eyes and look at the retina to see if there's any um, bleeding in that area as well. And listen to the patient. You know, do they have a bounding headache? Um, does their neck hurt? Does the back of their head hurt? Nursing diagnoses, uh, inadequate health maintenance, difficulty adhering to treatment plan, lack of knowledge. And of course, the goal is to reduce the blood pressure and uh, reduce sodium exercise, maintain fluid balance, get that BP in a normal range. Implementation, and we've already talked a lot about this, so just make sure that you go through and read through this again. It, it kind of says what we've already said. Um, health maintenance, you know, um, encourage patients a, a healthy lifestyle. Um, you know, help patients understand the progressive nature of hypertension, okay? Promote adherence to the treatment plan. They need to take their medicines every day. They need to follow up with their doctors. They need to um, make lifestyle modifications and, uh, you know, eat healthy and, and, and exercise and do the things that they need to do. Um, balance nutrition. Um, we all we, and teach them about the DASH diet and to lose weight and to get moving. And then... Uh, Fluid, look at these, this patient's feet. This, they've, I'm sure they've, if I put my finger on it, they got pitting edema. Now this could be from kidney disease, but that can make your um, blood pressure go up. Now, kidney disease may not be reversed, but they can modify diet with low sodium diet, um, uh, be on strict INOs and uh, weigh their self every day and report you know, any um, increase in weight. Uh, and then evaluation, of course, we want them to return to a normal uh, homeostasis where the blood pressure is normal. They're adhering to their medicines and their lifestyle modifications. They're taking their medicines and hopefully eventually they can get off of their medication. On uh, page 1310, there's a great nursing care plan. As I've said before, sometimes I do like to get questions about nursing interventions. Um, from the care plan, and in this particular care plan, we're doing a lot of teaching. We're teaching about meds. We're teaching how to monitor the blood pressure every day, how to weigh every day, when to report a weight gain, uh, how to exercise, low impact exercise, uh, stress reducing techniques such as, you know, just um, listening to music or, you know, just doing something that you enjoy.